to the front lines of the new labor and civil rights movement. On Flashpoints, black and brown lives really do matter. So join us here on KPFA every weekday at 5 p.m. Thank you. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for your own health and fitness. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm health integrationist Lena Berman with Jeff Fawcett, Ph.D. We come to you weekly with a critical, independent voice on the politics and practice of health. There's an issue that's being missed by most environmentalists, climate change activists, and indeed all activists who value freedom. The proliferation of wireless, non-ionizing radiation is a military-industrial complex wet dream. It is the perfect tool for surveillance and control of the masses, and it's coming to your home in many playful and fun devices that are connecting you with what you love and so much more. But for those of us who love this world and the life in it, these technologies have a very dark side. It's invisible and for many people undetectable, but for many of the world's creatures, plants and trees, it's disrupting and even life-threatening. Lost is the fact that the companies delivering this technology have a climate impact of magnitudes. The power needed to run the world may also be destroying it. Think about this when you replay this show on your iPhone. A mobile phone uses three times the energy of a landline, and it doesn't end there. Your civil liberties and indeed your health are being impacted as you're being entertained. Who is speaking out? Scientists, electrosensitives, and parents are discovering the extreme impact this wireless revolution is having. Today, we'll explore their experiences through a new book, An Electronic Silent Spring. Join us today as we hear from its author, Katie Singer. So what we're going to do today is, initially, I'm going to play a 16 and a half minute talk that Katie Singer gave um, and I'll give her give her introduction to you in a moment to the talk. And then, because this book is written as a forum structured to present different voices so that it offers alternative ways to approach the topic, Jeffrey and I will read some of the testimonials from the book. So first, let's get to Katie Singer's talk. Author Katie Singer's most recent book is An Electronic Silent Spring. Katie Singer works on public policy with the Electromagnetic Radiation Policy Institute, and she teaches internationally. Her website is electronicsilentspring.com. In October of 2014, she spoke at Techno-Utopianism and The Fate of the Earth Teach-In at Cooper Union in New York. Here is Katie Singer's talk, Radiation Soup. My mother gave birth to me in 1960, about a mile uptown, under bright electric lights, with an epidural that erased her pain and made her unconscious for my arrival. During my first day, nurses fed me commercial formula I could not digest. Compared to most people born after World War II, there's nothing special about my techno birth. Compared to most mammals, it's a recipe for abandonment and a life filled with the question, what is home? Besides home, I'm looking for people who want to know technology's dangers and who will practice self-regulation to protect nature and health. I figure I have come to the right place. I'd like to spell out some troubling rules and studies about electronics and some regulations we can implement ourselves. But first, let's go back a few billion years before man-made laws, before mobile phones, before these lights, 
when this planet was a mass of gases, water, dust, and rock. After a buildup of charge, lightning began to strike. A bombardment of lightning storms led to nucleic and amino acids, the building blocks of life. Early plants made oxygen and paved the way for animals. Plants and animals still function by electrochemical signals. So do our brains and our hearts. Even at rest, all cells have measurable voltage. In other words, without electromagnetic energy, none of us would be here. By 1880, we humans had figured out how to generate, store, and transmit electrical energy over long distances. We got electric lights, we got motors and built refrigerators, we got radio and TV. Since 1934, the Federal Communications Commission has said, go forth and invent electronics. As long as you don't create harmful interference, this means we cannot disrupt existing radio, TV, and now cellular or internet broadcasts. Harmful interference at the FCC has never included biological harm. Call this exclusion of nature. In 1996, our FCC filled the head of a 200-pound plastic man with salty fluid. The engineers called him Sam for a standard anthropomorphic man. They took Sam's temperature. They gave the dude a cell phone for six minutes, and then they took his temperature again. Sam's temp had changed by less than two degrees. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the FCC determined that mobile devices are safe. <laughs> Call this test insufficient. Next, everybody got a cell phone. Then came smartphones, which also transmit Wi-Fi. Providers installed about 300,000 cell towers in the U.S. In a few short years, we blanketed our environment with frequencies and amplitudes that do not exist in nature. Some of us want to know the non-thermal biological effects of exposure to electromagnetic radiation from wireless technologies. We want to know the effects of long-term exposure, more than six minutes. What happens if exposure begins in utero? What if a child can see a cell tower from her bedroom window? What if a utility company installs a microwave transmitting smart meter on your breaker box and you've got a medical implant. How do wildlife react around cell towers? If the FCC has considered these questions, they have not made their studies public. Many scientists have. If you want 1,800 peer-reviewed studies about the biological effects of EMR, electromagnetic radiation, please visit bioinitiative.org. Most of these studies come from Europe, the Middle East, Turkey, because United States telecom providers will not give your data, subscribers' usage data, to epidemiologists. This is another questionable situation. So what are the biological effects of exposure to EMR? Fundamental things are affected, including the rate of calcium released from a cell's membrane, the brain's metabolic rate, the rate of DNA breakage, melatonin production, decreased sperm production, and I will say my book is really well referenced, so everything I'm saying in this talk is in my book and referenced. A Swedish study found that people who begin using a digital cell phone as teenagers or younger have a 420% increased risk of brain cancer. South Korean teens now commonly have dementia, their doctors think this comes from excessive screen time and using only one side of their brains. After Wi-Fi was recently installed in Los Angeles schools, some children began bleeding from their noses and their ears. 
A British toddler was recently admitted to an addiction treatment center because she would not give up her iPad. When people with deep brain stimulators for Parkinson's ride in a Prius and the car breaks to stop and in the process recharges its battery, pulse magnetic fields from the car's computers shut off the medical implant. Men with erectile dysfunction are 2.6 times more likely to keep a cell phone in their front pants pocket. We all want men to assume more responsibility for birth control, but I don't think this qualifies. <laughs> Lots of folks just don't feel well after they get Wi-Fi installed or a new mobile device or their uh, utility installed smart meters or a cell tower goes up nearby. They don't sleep. They get headaches and memory problems. Their eyes strain. They get nausea and strange rashes. European and Russian studies since the 1960s associate these symptoms and many more with exposure to radio frequency radiation from radar and now mobile phones, cell towers, Wi-Fi, and smart meters. As for wildlife, a Spanish biologist studied a common frog habitat 140 meters from a cell tower. He built a metal box around these frogs. Two months later, these shielded frogs had a mortality of 4.2%. The unshielded frogs had a mortality of 90%. White stork pairs tried to build nests near antennas. When they do so, they often fought over sticks. Their sticks fell to the ground. The nests did not get built. Chicks frequently died. In a German study, 65% of bee colonies abandoned their hives when nearby cell towers went live. GMOs pesticides, and monocultures likely also play roles in colony collapse. But ill bees typically die in or near their hives. In this study, no ill bees were found. Bees use cryptochromes, magnetically sensitive genes in their eyes, to sense the Earth's electromagnetic energy fields and to navigate. Exposure to EMR emitted by cell towers disrupts cryptochrome-based navigation. Humans also have cryptochromes. They're involved in our sleep cycles. Here's another red flag. Section 704 of the 1996 Telecom Act states that no health or environmental concern may interfere with the placement of telecom equipment. Among other things, this means even if you can prove that a cell phone caused brain cancer, you cannot sue the provider. So, did Congress or AT&T know something they don't want us to know about how cell phones and towers affect health or wildlife? And why doesn't the FCC employ even one person to routinely measure radiation emitted by those 300,000 cell towers? Many people consider electronic technologies green, but broadcasting data wirelessly takes much more energy than transmitting data on copper wire or optical fiber. A mobile call requires three times as much energy as a corded landline call. To keep air conditioned, data centers require the equivalent of 30 nuclear power plants. If data centers were a country, they would rank fifth in use of energy. For the most part, modern technologies expand our use of energy. They do not curtail it. In March of 2014, the CDC reported that one in 42 boys now has autism. This number is up by nearly a third since 2012. We do not know the cause of autism, nor of this alarming trend. But a Bay Area pediatrician now has a free protocol that includes turning Wi-Fi off at night and keeping mobile devices away from children. One family had a nonverbal 10-year-old boy who screamed every night from 10 p.m. until 3 a.m. 
Within three days of turning off their Wi-Fi at night and unplugging their cordless phones, this boy spoke a complete sentence. This family lived on a military base, and still they kept reducing their own EMR emissions, and the doctor prescribed therapeutic grade fish oil. After three weeks, the boy's screaming stopped. He slept through the night. His mother's seizure disorder also decreased. And you can read my report, Calming Behavior in Children with Autism, on my website, electronicsilentspring.com, and you don't need autism to try the protocol. So please, let's get informed about the biological effects of exposure to electromagnetic radiation. The smart grid aims to reduce our use of electricity and make delivery of it more efficient. But most smart meters are wireless. They emit EMR. They create health hazards, violate security, and waste energy. Smart meters are not necessary for a smart grid. Smart meters can transmit pulsed EMR every 15 seconds. They can shut off cardiac pacemakers. Like other wireless technologies, they are not UL certified, which means that if a smart meter damages your house, your homeowner's insurance likely will not cover you. Safer technology is available for an intelligent grid. Let your utility commissioners know. Learn about transformers. Big transformers convert, convert voltages on the grid. Smaller transformers, switch mode power supplies, are used by mobile phones, compact fluorescent lights, and solar power inverters. Transformers can generate magnetic fields that apparently cause leukemia. Solar power can operate safely. You need uh, thoroughly filtered inverters that can deliver clean DC or AC electricity. Please be aware that broadband over power lines and distributed antenna systems can blanket your town in electromagnetic radiation. With new green ordinances, providers no longer need to prove that a new cell tower can withstand 130 mile per hour winds, for example. This is another red flag. Why would a legislator give up the permitting process when cell towers regularly collapse and catch fire. Around the, school, around the country, school systems have issued iPads for every child. Last July, FCC Chair Tom Wheeler committed $2 billion for high-speed Wi-Fi in our schools. Call these risks to every child's health, every child's mind. At the conclusion of Silent Spring, Rachel Carson called on pesticide users' humility. She asked pesticide users to acknowledge the vast forces with which they tampered. Could we get humble and acknowledge that using wireless technologies tampers with vast forces? Because of the extraordinary powers at our fingertips, we may lose sight of laws that value mobile devices more than our ecosystem and our health. We might ignore that depending on a mobile phone gives technology and corporations control of our lives. We may fail to notice that no app can steer us home. Clearly, the FCC and telecom providers value profits more than our ecosystem and our health. If we value health and nature more than an electronic device, then what is our responsibility? I think we've got to start making limits. To begin, consider not using mobile devices around pregnant women or children. Get cabled internet access. Think twice before using a mobile device in a moving car or train. At every mile, your phone connects to a new base station and goes to maximum power. EMR gets trapped in the car and bounces around. That is not good. Join others who've gotten smart meters removed and analog utility meters restored to their homes. Guard building codes for safe installation of new and upgraded cell towers. Is anyone here ready to commit to even one of these limits starting today? Would you stand up?
Thank you very much. You're listening to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman, and with Jeff Fawcett, PhD. You've been listening to a talk by author Katie Singer. She, uh, her newest book is An Electronic Silent Spring. My Life, Six Feet Under Ten Cell Antennas by Veronica Chandre. In November 2009, an array of cell phone antennas was placed on Veronica Chandre's apartment building in downtown Toronto. Like the building's other residents, she learned about the installation as the cranes arrived. Here she is. If you had told me three months ago not to hold a cell phone to my header body, I would have listened politely, but I would not have changed a thing. If you told me to exchange my cordless phones for old-fashioned corded phones, I would have listened, but I wouldn't have changed anything. I liked my cordless phones. If you had told me to use an Ethernet cable with my laptop and to keep airport, airport mode turned on or to move the Wi-Fi router from my bedroom and to turn it off at night when not in use or to get rid of my Wi-Fi altogether, I would have wondered why would I want to do any of that. If you had told me three months ago that baby monitors should not be placed near babies, nor to ask my 14-year-old daughter to text more than talk and not to sleep with her phone or computer on the pillow beside her or to replace every fluorescent light with an incandescent one, I would have listened. But I probably would not have changed a thing. If you had told me that the microwave radiation emitted by cell phones, cordless phones, Wi-Fi, cellular antennas, and other wireless technologies causes people to experience all matter of symptoms from insomnia to high blood pressure and heart palpitations and anxiety and should be avoided completely or at least whenever possible, I still wouldn't have changed a thing. After all, the government approves of these devices and the media tells us that they're safe. But before three months ago, I had not lived six feet under ten cellular antennas that were installed on the roof above my balcony. Before three months ago, I had health and vitality. I slept like a baby. I did not wake up with numb hands and feet, my body feeling prickly all night and tingling or vibrating almost all day. I did not spend night after night in a hyperactive state, feeling like electricity was running through me. Before, I lived in a house that I loved. It was my sanctuary. I did not have hissing, buzzing, or high-pitched ringing in my ear. I did not ever get tension headaches. I did not feel an invisible band wrapped around my head creating pressure. I did not feel bouts of nausea on a regular basis, sometimes accompanied by a metallic taste in my mouth. And I did not get dizzy spells. I was not afraid that I might have a heart attack as I slept on a makeshift floor mattress in my living room and felt my heart race all night. I was not without focus or direction or ability to concentrate. I never felt shocks from touching my mattress, my light switches, my pots, or my cats. My daughter did not have inexplicable rashes that hurt in her skin, as she described it. She did not have headaches or feel nauseous or dizzy in our home or experience the blood in her hands going cold. She never had sleepless nights. Before three months ago, I had not talked with someone who could have sold me thousands of dollars worth of products by convincing me that they would alleviate the situation, but advised me instead, if you care about your health and your daughter, get out of there. You have to move. I had never abandoned my home. I had never couch surfed with my 14 year old in tow while trying to maintain some semblance of a normal life. I had not spent 15 days getting two hours of sleep each night because my body vibrated all the time. I had not cried for hours feeling like I was losing my mind from sleep deprivation and from feeling fight or flight 24 hours each day. I had not researched everything. I could find to educate myself about the dangers of exposure to human-made electromagnetic frequencies and microwave radiation. I was not fully aware of cellular antennas and the invisible wireless web that continues to grow all around all of our heads. I could not tell the difference between a bell 
cell antenna, a Rogers Global Alive Tellulus or wind cell antenna. I never heard of an Industry Canada or Spectrum, Canada's, Canada Safety Code 6 or the Bio Initiative Report. I had not spoken to... Health Canada, Industry Canada, the Canadian Environmental Legal Association, Environmental Health Clinic, Environmental Health Association, the Environmental Protection Office, the Toronto Environmental Alliance, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, or my city councillor's office trying to find out whether it's safe to live six feet under ten cellular antennas. So far, none of them have told me it's not safe. But thankfully, I have a body that tells me the truth and the good judgment to listen to my body. Before three months ago, I did not have clear and unpleasant physical reactions to my cell phone or my cell phones used by people or cell phones used by people near me. I did not get off buses because half the passengers were texting or talking and the RF signals bouncing around the bus were more than my body could handle. I did not react to the touch of my computer keyboard or from sitting close to the monitor for too long. I did not feel my legs tingling and going slightly numb if I spent too much time in a room with Wi-Fi. I did not feel nausea and have sharp pains go through my hand and up my arm if I made a phone call with a wireless phone or a cell phone. I did not feel nauseous if I sat too long or too close to a television. I do, for now. Before three months ago, I could not have told you when I stood within four blocks of a cellular antenna installation. I never thought twice about leaning on walls or in close proximity to the electrical wiring in a room or lying on a floor above a basement for the same reasons. I never considered the effects of my neighbor's Wi-Fi and cordless phone base stations broadcasting through the walls between us. I had never heard the words electrosensitive or electro-hypersensitive. I had not spent hours and hours on the phone trying to find a doctor who knows what a cellular antenna and its effects of living six feet under ten of them. The few I found who knew what I was talking about and who could offer treatment that would have been good for me cost an arm and a leg and a plane ticket. Before three months ago, I had not stayed in six places over nine days just trying to get a good night's sleep because even after friends and family unplugged their Wi-Fi and cordless phones and everything but the fridge, my body reacted to their neighbor's wireless devices, which emitted through the walls where I tried to sleep. Before, I only knew the benefits of wireless devices. I had not heard of EMF Solutions, Earthcom, MagdaHavis.com, the WEEP initiative, the Electrosensitive Society, Living, Safe Living Technologies.com, a Q-Link, a Gauss meter, or an electric smog meter. I had not read stories from hundreds of people around the world whose lives have been profoundly impacted by something we've come to believe is purely beneficial and harmless, something we cannot see, microwave radiation from wireless devices that emit at levels not meant for human absorption. Three months ago, I was blindsided. My life got turned upside down by radiation from cellular antennas. Now, I'm looking for a new home. I'm challenged by the fact that I've got to consider my recently acquired sensitivities more than the home's location, size, cost, or style. Please, pay attention Pay attention to the choices you make and the ones that others make for you. Pay attention now before you pay dearly. Gary Olhoft, geophysicist and electrical engineer, Professor Emeritus, Colorado School of Mines. He says, despite the fact that 10% of Americans, more than 25 million people, have a medical implant, no agency studies their experience around wireless devices. Many of these people may find their implant malfunctioning, including shutting off. If they board an airplane, share an elevator with a mobile phone user, or step through a security door at a library or a mall. No agency studies the interference that may occur between devices when a cochlear implant is installed in a person who already has a deep brain stimulator and a pacemaker. 
We need to broaden public awareness about the vulnerability of people with medical implants. We also need regulation that will limit electromagnetic emissions. We need to create limits around secondhand exposures to electromagnetic radiation since, for example, being in a metal-walled elevator with a person who is using a mobile phone can be especially hazardous for people with implants. At a minimum, stores and other places with security and Wi-Fi devices, now often not visible but hidden behind walls, should post warnings that a potential hazard exists for people with implanted medical devices and radio frequency sickness. We need to take a brief musical break. Uh, This is Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Lena Berman with Jeff Fawcett. We um, are doing a program uh, about the book An Electronic Silent Spring. So please stay with us. We'll be right back after this. Fitness. I'm Lena Berman with Jeffrey Fawcett, Ph.D. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature. Find a free stream of this week's show, our book, and lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. If you need to reach us, please do it by email at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at yourownhealthandfitness.org. George Tabor is a retired nuclear structural inspector for the U.S. Navy. He says, For more than two decades, my work included inspecting nuclear power plants on submarines for structural errors. The Navy obeyed NAVC guidelines, which limit the amount of radiation that workers can be exposed to by the quarter and by the year. Every day, my body was tested to ensure that I was not exposed to more radiation than NAVC allowed. Over the years, the standards changed, and we workers were allowed less exposure. Before the Navy let me work, I signed that I understood that I would be exposed to ionizing radiation and that it could harm my health. I retired in 1995. Around 2007, citywide Wi-Fi got installed in my town. Smart meters arrived in 2010. After these installations, my diabetes symptoms got worse, and I developed heart arrhythmia, sleep apnea, and nervous tension. In the summer of 2013, a new device was put on the utility pole near my house. I've heard that it connects Wi-Fi, the smart grid, and emergency response communications. Is this true? I don't know. Is this safe? I don't know. But when I stand on my porch, I feel dizzy, like someone kicked me in the knees. I get headaches and frequent nightmares. I lose my strength and become easily irritable. I removed all wireless devices and services from my house, but I still don't feel well here. Several times I've slept on a friend's sofa a few towns away. I bought an oximeter, which measures the oxygen in my blood. According to my doctor, a reading of 97% or higher means I'm getting the oxygen I need. 17 miles out of town, I'm at a healthy 99%. In town, I usually measure 88% to 95%. Once, it measured 83% in town. I got an acoustometer from lessemfs.com to identify hot spots of extremely low frequencies and radio frequencies around my house and the city. On my porch, I usually find electric fields of 0.07 to 1.0 volts per meter. Downtown, 3.0 
4.0 and even 5.0 volts per meter are common. These are not safe levels, especially for 24-7 exposure. They are likely Wi-Fi and cell phone signals, maybe also TV and taxi dispatch signals. The BioInitiative 2012 report advises limiting electric field exposures to 0.03 volts per meter. The EPA advises keeping exposures to less than 0.13. The FCC says to keep it to less than 2.0 volts per meter. Clearly, it's high time for a government agency to determine, monitor, and enforce safe levels of ELFs and RF fields, just like the Navy does for workers exposed to ionizing radiation. Bird collisions and telecom equipment. Albert Manville, Ph.D., wildlife biologist with the Division of Migratory Bird Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is U.S. FWS estimates that up to 6.8 million birds die per year in collisions with telecommunication antennas or their guy support wires in North America. The impacts of cellular antenna radiation on migratory birds in North America, especially those nesting close to these structures, remains suspect and unknown. Here's Dr. Manville, January 2012. Recent studies from Europe raise troubling concerns about the effects of radiation from cellular communication antennas, especially on resident breeding migratory birds. These apparent effects include feather deformities, weight loss, weakness, reduced survivorship and death, especially to those birds and their offsprings nesting adjacent to cellular antennas. Where before-after control impact BACI studies were performed during some of the European research, no effects to resident birds were detected prior to construction and operation of cellular communication antennas. Some laboratory studies in the U.S. have documented lethal effects of extremely low levels of radiation to chicken embryos in the frequencies of cellular telephones. But research to better address cause and effect to wild birds in North America has yet to be conducted. To date, only anecdotal, anecdotal reports from instances in North America have been brought to the attention of authorities at the USFWS. If we are to better understand the cumulative effects of human infrastructure on migratory birds, including communication technologies, research needs to be conducted to specifically address how radiation is affecting migratory birds and what resultant lethal and injurious effects are occurring. The explosive growth of handheld technologies raises further concerns since potential impacts may grow. The unpermitted killing or injury of a migratory bird is called a, quote, take under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The USFWS does not permit the, quote, incidental or accidental take, a close quote, of any of the 1,007 migratory bird species protected under MBTA. Therefore, studies need to be undertaken to determine how much take is occurring as a result of radiation and what steps can be undertaken to avoid or minimize future take. The USFWS continues to suggest to the FCC the need for these North American studies based alone on cumulative effects that must be addressed under the National Environmental Policy Review. These studies need to better tease out how and, and at what level takes are occurring, then determine what conservation measures can be adopted to avoid or minimize future take. Because of the controversial nature of this issue, any studies and outcomes need to be seamless and fully transparent, close quote. And from Katie's book, The White Stalk, and I will mention here in my own voice that if people are not aware of it, white stalks are very magical and, and extraordinary birds that have mating rituals where they dance. So people love storks. Katie Singer. During the spring of 2002, 2003, and 2004, biologist Alfonso Balmori monitored the reproduction of the white stork, a vulnerable bird species that lives usually in urban areas. 
White stork couples build their nests in pinnacles and other very high places that are now exposed to human-made microwaves. Balmori studied white stork nests within 200 meters of antennas and nests located more than 300 meters from antennas. He found that 40% of the nests within 200 meters of antennas had no chicks, while only 3.3% of nests further than 300 meters of antennas had no chicks. Also near antennas, white stork couples frequently fought for sticks. Their sticks fell to the ground while they tried to build nests. The nests did not get built, and the hatched white stork chicks frequently died. Common citizens have also observed changes in birds when technologies that emit EMR are deployed. After transmitting, water meters were installed in Renton, Washington in December 2012. A retired civil engineer who had spent $30 per month on bird seed for years noticed that the feeders in his yard no longer emptied. His neighbors also noticed that immediately after the transmitting water meters were installed, the birds that had frequented their yards beside a greenbelt had disappeared. You're listening to Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Lena Berman with Jeff Fawcett. Uh, we're doing a show today about Katie Singer's new book, An Electronic Silent Spring. I would like to go over the section in Katie Singer's book, An Electronic Silent Spring, Facing the Dangers and Creating Safe Limits, about wildlife health and radio frequency fields. So let's let's talk about trees. A 2010 paper published in the International Journal of Forestry Research, researcher Katie Haggerty, explained that the Earth's natural radio frequency environment has remained about the same within the lifespan of modern trees. So before, she says, before 1800, Haggerty wrote, the major components of this environment were broadband radio noise from space, galactic noise, from lightning, atmospheric noise, and a smaller RF component from the sun. Plants have evolved to use environmental signals along with visible light to regulate their periodic functions. Therefore, they may be sensitive to human-made RF fields. The background of RF pollution, Haggerty continued, is now many times stronger than the naturally occurring RF environment. From the perspective of of evolutionary time, the change can be considered sudden and dramatic. Growth rates of plants and fungi can be increased or decreased by RF exposure. Exposure to RF signals can induce plants to produce more meristems, effects root cell structure and induce stress response causing biochemical changes. Haggerty went on to describe her study of the influence of RF signals on trembling aspen seedlings, seedlings that were shielded in a Faraday cage, so that's a metal container that goes all the way around in all directions that prevents RF radiation from entering. Those seedlings thrived. Seedlings that were exposed to RF signals showed necrotic lesions and abnormal coloring in their leaves. Necrotic means dead tissue. And um, according to British biologist Dr. Andrew Goldsworthy, quote, trees are now dying, dying mysteriously from a variety of diseases in urban areas all over Europe. They also show abnormal photoperiodic responses. Many have cancer-like growths under the bark. The bark may also split so that the underlying tissues become infected. All of these can be explained as a result of exposure to weak RF fields from mobile phones and their base stations, Wi-Fi and similar sources of weak non-ionizing radiation. Other scientists have found that trees in areas with high Wi-Fi activity suffer from bleeding fissures in their bark. The death of parts of leaves and abnormal growth, all included in this. Also in 2010, in the Netherlands, 70% of urban ash trees suffered from radiation sickness, including a lead-like shine on their leaves, indicating the leaves' oncoming death. In 2005, only 10% of ash trees suffered radiation sickness. So this is all since 2005. Now, in terms of ants, in terms of, you know, and we always say that the last, the last thing that will be living is, is uh, cockroaches and ants, but maybe not. So, in 2013, recently, Belgian biologist Marie-Claire 
Kamerz, I'm not sure how to pronounce the French names, C-A-M-M-A-E-R-T, uh, and, and Swedish neuroscientist who we've interviewed, Ole Johansson, exposed ants to common wireless devices. So to go on, when they put a mobile phone on standby mode under the ants' nests, the ants left their nests immediately, taking their eggs, larvae, and nymphs with them. They relocated far from the phone. Once the phone was removed, the ants returned to their original location. After 30 minutes of exposure to a Wi-Fi router, the ants' speed changed, as did their foraging behavior. It took them six to eight hours to resume normal foraging. Several ants never recovered and were found dead a few days later. This is a segment from the section here. And it concludes with, the researchers concluded that ants can be used as biological indicators to reveal the biological effects of RF signals from some wireless devices. They also advised users to deactivate the Wi-Fi function of their computers. Now, there's been a lot of talk about whether colony collapse is is connected to this same problem with the, the wireless here. So again, segment here from Katie Singer's book, An Electronic Silent Spring, under bees. This is a segment. Um, there is a German scientist, Ulrich Werner, and he wrote a book called Bees, Birds, and Mankind, Effects of Wireless Communication Technologies. It was published by Ketchum in 2009. Um, what uh, what what he did uh, with another, um, he quotes uh, Ferdinand Rusch, Ru- <laughs> I'm coming up with these names, Ruzika, a scientist and beekeeper who reported to him in 2003. Ruzika then organized a, a survey of beekeepers throughout the magazine, uh, Der Bindenwasser, <laughs> forgive my foreign pronunciations. All 20 of the beekeepers who replied to his questionnaire had a transmitter within 300 meters of their beehives. Compared to the bees' behavior before and after the transmitters were in operation, 37.5% observed increased aggression from their bees. 25% found a quarter found that their bees had a greater tendency to swarm. 65% reported that their colonies were inexplicably, inexplicably collapsing since the transmitters became op- uh, operational. So, in May 2009, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service urged Congress to investigate the potential relationship between wireless devices and bee colony collapse. I'd love to know whether they have any conclusions. So, um, one last piece is on frogs. And I think we all know that when frogs start going, we know something's wrong. In 2010, Spanish biologist, now I can pronounce this, Alfonso Balmori, published his study of a common frog habitat 140 meters from a cellular antenna. The experiment lasted two months, from the egg phase until an advanced phase of tadpole, Balmori placed some of the frogs inside a Faraday cage. Again, these are shields. These shielded frogs had a mortality rate of 4.2%. The unshielded frogs exposed to the antenna's RF fields had a mortality rate of 90%. Balmori concluded that, quote, this research may have huge implications for the natural world which is now being exposed to high microwave radiation levels from a multitude of own masts. So Katie Singer's book, An Electronic Silent Spring, contains in the back lots of information about what should happen next, how individuals should protect themselves and other people, including children, about schools, uh, how to approach lawmaking bodies, municipal bodies, how to approach manufacturers, how to push for what you want, what sorts of things you might ask for. But it occurs to me that in these 15 years of the two of us covering these issues on the air, what is it that we're asking for, for from people? What are we hoping that people will do and what, what, what they will get to from listening to this? I think on the one hand that what we're asking people to do is be appropriately frightened be appropriately concerned, 
but know that there are things that you can do, ranging from extremely personal to extremely public. And that, for me, the the uh, most significant thing that we should be thinking about is something that we've talked about on the show before called an inverted inverted quarantine, which is to focus strictly on the things that will keep you safe, which of course means that the f- root causes of environmental disasters, environmental risks, go unaddressed, and the forces of evil um, simply march along to their own to their own drum. So on the one hand, uh, there, there there's a lot of there's a lot of good reason to believe that we should find ways to protect ourselves how up to and including get out get out get out which means what which means find a safe place uh find a, a community uh, well i read this um uh this testimonial by george tabor who found that he was he was living in a town that was making him sick and discussed, talked about moving, or not moving, but how he felt better at a friend's house several, three towns away. So that's the kind of thing, that kind of drastic thing is, that's an action that you can take. But it shouldn't be the only action that, that you take. It should also uh, include attending to those public forums and, and government body uh, government bodies that make decisions about where Wi-Fi antennas are put and where cell towers are placed and, uh, and so on. Can I just comment on that piece? Sure. Okay, so one of the it, I was going to mention that as well, but one of the parts that's complicated about this is that on a local level, if you're trying to determine where towers are possibly going to go near you or antennas, it means that you have to become acquainted with your planning department locally and you have to pressure them. You have to keep calling them and you have to have other people who are interested in the same thing call on a regular basis, like once a month, to ask, do you have any new proposals? Where are they? What's going on with them? Because you have to know about these things before they get to the point uh, where it has to be appealed. You want to get to it early in the process, to, in some cases just to scare away the installation and to make sure that people know that you don't want it, that there's a group of people who don't want it early. And the the critical part of that is uh, that people don't want it, plural, people. Not just somebody complains, but that it will become an issue. Uh, These folks want all this stuff to be done in the dark so that as um, uh, Veronica Chandre Chandre, um, noted that she didn't know anything about those those cell, cell antennas that were above her head until literally the cranes moved in. Right. Um, that's the, w- once that's happened, you're pretty much cooked uh, figuratively and li- literally. That um, making this, a, and, and no doubt uh, where you are, there are people who are active in, in this issue one way or another, or if they aren't, which is why we open the show with why isn't this a bigger environmental uh, issue, that environmental groups should be encouraged to make this a priority issue. And so if you're a member of uh, Name Your Favorite Group that uh, battles for environmental issues in your local, uh, in your local area, that encourage your group if they haven't already, to make EMF and uh, Wi-Fi and wireless technologies an important issue on the agenda, something that is monitored and that you as an activist group take action on. Additionally, one of the problems is that it depends on what part of the country you're in, those of you listening, but in California... Uh, there's uh, such there's such a robust embracing of all these technologies. California is a technology state, and they love this stuff. So it's you're the odd man out if you don't love this stuff. Um, so 
one of the things about get out, get out, get out is finding an area often that's less populous and, and in some cases less affluent because those are the places that are less likely to be aggressively targeted by the telecoms. Uh, they're they're more likely to have a, a slightly because it doesn't pay for them to to do it unless they have to. So, remember that the federal government has an agenda to cover the entire planet in Wi-Fi. So there's a lot of work to be done, but a lot of it on the on the local level. And finding out early is absolutely imperative. Get, staying on it, having a group, organizing a group, uh, pamphleting people, finding out who's interested, and that sort of thing. Which to be realistic. Uh, does not always mean that you will be successful in keeping something no. out. No, yes, as we know. <laughs> um, because there are lots of uh, well-meaning people who who believe that wireless technologies need to be blanketed everywhere so that we can have emergency services, services right, for, right. for example. Right, uh, we've been doing without all that for a long time with no problem. Yeah. And... and we These are folks issues. who want to, and of, and of course, it, it, it breeds off of or it, it grabs a set that, oh, my God, uh, uh, fear of some, you know, disaster or fire or what have you is going to overwhelm us. And so, of course, we need um, those, those communication services for emergency services to work properly. And those claims need to be examined Critically, mm-hmm. they need to be challenged as to whether this is actually true. Because in my experience, generally, it makes no difference whether you have that stuff or not. That it doesn't perform; those emergency services don't perform any better. No more lives are saved. It's just the blind belief that that technology is going to save us. Yeah, it doesn't actually wor- doesn't seem to work. It doesn't look like it works better than uh, the ham radio systems and other systems that uh, communities have been using. But the, point, but the point here is that whatever the rationale and whatever the local group is that is promoting it, chances are always good. Uh, two things. One is that their claims are spurious, or so they're simply assuming that this stuff is going to be great because it's the new, new technology. But the other is that, particularly if you look at the uh, places like the resources in Katie Singer's book, that uh, there are other people who have gone through this same experience. I want to talk a little bit about another thing that people can do, which I think is terribly important, which is um, most people that I talk to are very sympathetic and they are frightened of the health effects, but they don't want to let go of their devices or they have a job that won't allow them to, et cetera, et cetera. So we want them to be educated on how to protect themselves, but among other things, we want them not to add to the secondhand exposure for people who are vulnerable, either people who are already now electrosensitive or even more importantly, children. Um, and people with medical implants. So do not, as Katie Singer says, use these devices on public transportation because they have to ramp up to work and their signals are very, very strong. Do not use them in elevators. Um, reduce the amount of exposure that you expose people to in the world around you. And if you're electrosensitive, when you talk to your neighbors and your friends about this, remember that if you are strident and frightened, which is how you feel, that they won't be able to respond. But if you give them very simple messages like, please, if you have your smartphone with you, please wrap it in aluminum foil uh, after you turn it off uh, when you're at my house, or please leave your car further away from my house because it has various devices inside it that will affect me. But don't be, just say, geez, you know, I get a headache around these cell phones and stuff. It just bothers me. So I just like it if you could. So help the rest of us who don't want to be exposed to these things by not exposing us by using these devices in crowded areas and in closed buildings and on public uh, transportation and elevators. That would help a great deal. Get to know your neighbors and your friends and educate them so that they don't contribute to the ambient secondhand smog, smog, uh, electro smog that's covering the entire planet and all the areas around everybody. Um, That seems very important to remember and that would be very helpful. I want to thank you all for listening. I'm Lena Berman. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature. Find a free stream of this week's show 
a full hour, our book, and lots more at your own health and fitness.org. Please, if you want to reach us, email us at admin, A D M I N, at your own health and fitness.org. Your own health and fitness is produced by Lena Berman and Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett. Remember, being informed not only protects. Hello, I'm Veronica Faison. I got my mojo working, baby. And I'm going to try it on you. Yeah, 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 I'm going to try it on you. I'm inviting you to join me on my new talk show, The Week Starts Here. Sunday night, 7.30 to 9 p.m. on KPFA. Together, you and I will tear down barriers.